Bird, 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 bird. Feeling, I'm feeling spry. Hey, everybody. It's Ron Bain with the Hunting Dog Podcast. It is 6th of September. It's Labor Day. You know, I did a little Googling. Do you know Labor Day started in 1894? It was the, the first time it became a federal holiday. It was to mark uh, a bunch of people who worked way too hard and way too many hours. So we've been getting three-day weekends off for that long. I had no idea. 127 years ago, Labor Day. Yeah, so celebrate. Have a beer, have some fun, have a picnic, have a barbecue. Do something. Or, like I'm not doing, historically, for way more than half, probably two-thirds of the last decade and a half, I've been in Virginia at Labor Day, uh, not laboring, but shooting doves. And this year, I'm not there. It's it's sad. I'm very sad. Very happy. We had the family come over. They all spent the night. We had time at the pool. <clears throat> we had a little fire last night. We played a little trivia. Great time. But I didn't get to pull the trigger on nothing. Anyway, hopefully that, that changes here in the next week or two. But I got so much stuff going on. I got I to pick up a new pup in a week and a half, which is going to screw my trip up to go next weekend of... It's a long story. I'm sorry. I got uh, all kinds of stuff. Just it doesn't doesn't matter. Let's let's as, as what's his name says. Lock the gates, okay? First and foremost, my Patreon patrons, they keep coming and I keep loving them and I keep giving them any discount I can because they know if they write me, I'll say, hey, I can't do that, but I can do this, or I I can do this, but I can't do that. But the only way to find that out is if you're a Patreon patron, you know, and then you get to come to the Zoom rooms, which last Thursday's Zoom room was really, really interesting. We covered everything from e-collars to e-commerce to political correctness to you name it. We covered the gamut. Uh, it was it was a lot of fun, and it, it's, a, it's a growing crowd. It's just a great way. We got a little early reports from... Uh, from my buddy Connor over in South Dakota. Uh, yeah, it's don't miss the Zoom room. If there's one reason to do it besides feel like you're, you know, a patron of the arts, and this ain't no art, um, come it, just come to it for the Zoom rooms. Come hunting season. We're going to be giving pins away. We're going to be giving, well, there's a lot of stuff. Anyway, almost right there, right next to my love of my patron pa- Patreon patrons is my title sponsor, Pike Gear, technical clothing for the Upland Hunter. Okay, and Brent is going to be for you Michiganders, you know, and and it's kind of, you know, I could say for you Ohioans and you Indianans, is that the right word? Or you Hoosiers and you you, and you Buckeyes. But anyway, for my Michigan friends and listeners who have been Pike Gear curious, Brent is going to have a booth set up at the Woods and Waters Festival, September 10th and through the 12th next this coming. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, September 10th, 11th, and 12th, Woods and Waters, okay? Look it up. Just Google it if you never heard of it. I actually had a booth there about three years ago just to introduce the podcast to people. They have hunting, fishing, uh, kayaking. They have stuff for kids to do. They got a huge, huge area of breeders and puppies for people to look at. Uh, It's a long, long long-standing tradition in, in Michigan, the Woods and Waters Outdoor I don't know what they call it, outdoor rama. Anyway, so Brent's going to be there with all the pike gear to try on, kick the wheels, pull the zippers, fit it, put it on, and say, like, wow, I see what Ron's talking about. This shit is comfortable. Uh, you probably won't see gunner kennels up there, but you will see them if you ever come by my place or come to Virginia or you go to anywhere I go, you're going to see the gunner kennel and food crate, the only one out there, the only company who's got the, the plastic to guarantee for a lifetime. That's right. Gunner's got the plastic. That's what it is, right? It's resin. I don't know what it is. You know, you know, you know the inference I was talking about. Anyway, Gunner guarantees their products for the life of your ownership of that, or even if it passes down in your will. It's all everything guaranteed. Kind of like Purina, guarantee that nine out of ten champion dogs eat Purina. 
Now, I can't say that 9 out of 10 champion dogs have their food stored in a gunner kennel, but it will be only a matter of time. Or in a gunner food crate. Durr. Durr. And Onyx Maps, if you know where you stand, you, you need to tie this into your trip out west. South Dakota wants you to come out there. Load up your Onyx Map. Know where you've been. Set a pin with Onyx. South Dakota has got the birds this year. I, I'm only reading the copy, okay? But actually, I have it on good authority from one of my buddies that he had to stop the brush hog several times in an area he did not normally have to do that. So look for those areas that didn't get hit too hard by drought, and South Dakota did not get hit like Montana and North Dakota. Check out South Dakota this year. Don't miss it. Millions of acres to roam around, all kinds of opportunity. It's, it's the wide open west. Yeah, and, of course, you want to bring your Onyx. So you can go HDP 20, or you can use – everybody's got a code for Onyx. You know, just pick up Life Magazine. I'm sure there's an Onyx ad in there with a code for 20% off. Don't pay full price, but call me if you have a problem with your Onyx. CZ USA, look no farther for your next shotgun. It is here. The season's here. Like I said, I should have been dove hunting with my CZ. I'm not yet. It saddens me, but I've seen plenty of them on Instagram – taken huns and sharp tails and and doves so yeah when you when you're ready and then when you when you are successful with that CZ shotgun and you've <clears throat> you've already gotten your Walton's catalog that I've been telling you for 4 months to get the Walton's catalog cuz they got everything but the meat you got the meat because you got the gun, because you got the dog, because you use Onyx, because you feed Purina, because you store it in Gunner, because you wear Pike gear, because you use Boss Shot Shells, because you go to South Dakota, because you read Shooting Sportsman, because you go to W Hunting Supply when you need something <clears throat> from Garmin, like the Alpha 10, okay? So, boy, did I tie that in? Walton's has everything but the meats because you have everything else to help you get the meat. Check out their spices. They are, they are amazing spices. They're my my favorite. Even though I've probably made five different things, it's still their better burger. I don't know what they did in there, but it tastes like a burger right off the grill in Chicago, my hometown of Chicago, which makes a pretty good patty. Patty, not like patty bird for pat, patty, like a hamburger patty. Canine Athlete has everything you need for your dog. Don't overlook your dog's hydrating and recovering his probiotics needs his his if he's especially if it's a little older start shooting a little new dog into the food so you can see a new dog this year try it and boss shotgun shells i'm telling you it's getting it's getting there you got to go on their website and see what they got they are they are running around the clock doing everything they can but i'm telling you do not dilly do not dally Get those Boss shotgun shells so you can go out west. You can hunt WMAs. You can hunt private land. You don't have to be switching from lead to non-tox. <clears throat> it, it's silly. It, it's almost silly now. Yeah. Now, obviously, if I go to Virginia, I'm going to be shooting Beer Mountain, which everybody knows I make my own lead shot, which works deadly on doves at 20 yards, no further. But if you're not shooting doves in Virginia with me, go to Boss Shot Shells. Figure out what you need for your gun so you can shoot non-tox. So you don't have to worry about it. Be nice. Be green. I don't think it's green. I think it's a federal law. Shooting Sports Magazine, it is still my favorite. Guns, birds, dogs, people, and places. And double U Hunting Supply. I, I got to say this again because another person wrote me. I can't find that website for them. It's double U, D-O-U-B-L-E. U, the letter U like unicorn. Double U Hunting Supply, where you can get, well, you can get all your garment. You can get the garment, uh, you brand new, right? You can get the you can get the ten right now. Double U Hunting Supply. You will not get better service. You you can't get better anything. I mean, think of it. L listen, everything I tell you about. Double U Shooting Sports Mag, great magazine. South Dakota. Where else do you want to go? It's beautiful. I love South Dakota. Boss Shot Shunt. Bot shot shells. Show the bird who's boss. Garmin. One word says it all. Canine athlete. Treat your dog like an athlete. Waltons. Everything but the meat. CZ. Look no further. Onyx. Know where you stand. Purina. Nine out of ten. You know what that means. Pike gear. Be comfortable while you're doing all those things, using all those products. You know what else I'm going to do? 
No, I'm not yet. Next week. I think I got everything. Who knows? That was only nine minutes of blabbering on. It was a, it was a long night. We had the campfire last night, and uh, I'll be honest with you, I'm a little tired. You got the history of Labor Day. You know what we're doing. This podcast was done with Bob Ferris on a Sunday morning, no, Monday morning, after a three-day test. Uh, Bob was a long, long time NAVDA judge. Before he was a NAVDA guy, he was competitive with Chessies and Labs in the retrieving world. Bob has got a history of with the Poodle Pointer Alliance. It's it's something I was trying to do with the Bracco Italianos, and I couldn't find enough breeders to do it with. Well, Bob found enough breeders with the Poodle Pointer, and uh, they have had some remarkable results with the North American Poodle Pointer Alliance. They even had to do a revamp, and that's why we're we're going to cover a little bit of history, but we're going to talk about the revamp, the revamp of the N. A P P A, yeah, revamp, new and improved, set the bar higher, set the bar higher by, you know what I'm saying. Here we go, and uh, I will say this: the host of this show takes no responsibility for the comments that he or anybody else makes. Is that? I don't know. You know what that means. Listen to Bob, great guy, great storyteller. Hey everybody, it's Ron Bain with the Hunting Dog Podcast. I'm sitting in Bob Ferris's living room with Jesse. I don't know what is Jesse, Bob. It, uh, <laughs> my wife, my wife calls this dog a Shih Tzu. I call him uh, a Shih Tzu. <laughs> I think I stepped on his shits last night going to the bathroom, <laughs> but it turned out to be his little bitty rawhide that he carries oh, yeah. around with him. He's got. He's like having a two-year-old. Always underfoot. Well, he's. Just I already got, stepped on him once, you know, this morning. <laughs> he's got toys everywhere. He's just like having a. It's like having a daycare when you look around this house. He's got. I know toys. your kids are grown and grandkids are grown, and now you got. Now I got Jesse. You got yeah, Jesse. You guys just can't help in the. Uh, you're going to have a kid around this house no matter what, apparently. <laughs> well, anyway, I was out. Uh, I got asked to judge the uh, Treasure Valley chapter test Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And I told Bob that, yes, I would uh, be glad to come out and do it, but he owed me another interview because I, it's a constant influx of, you know, being in the podcast. I'm getting into this. I'm thinking of this dog. I'm thinking of this breed. And I followed a lot of what, you know, people refer to as the Poodle Pointer Alliance, common sense, or, or let, let's... Let's not be a breed club. Let's be a breeders club. I tried to kind of do that with a, a few Bracco people early on, and I ran into a roadblock. So, Bob, how did you not run into a roadblock, or did you, when it came to finding poodle pointer breeders that wanted to, you know, set that bar or raise it? How did you? I, th- I think in the beginning there was there weren't a lot of breeders in there. You know, this the alliance was created. I'm not sure, maybe 25 years ago. And there's only 14 breeders. Uh, they all came here to, they all came here from Idaho. And uh, they came from Quebec, Florida, Pennsylvania, Ohio, California, Oregon. And we just, we created an alliance mainly for the concerns of the breed and trying to continue it as a top end versatile hunting dog. And, uh, you know, as years went on, we acquired new members, and, and I, it was kind of fantastic how, how well it worked. Bill Athens in Ohio, it was kind of his, his brainstorm and his, his, his baby. And uh, as, as the years went on, though, I think, we had, I think we had 49 breeders in the alliance. In the alliance. And from the start of 14. From the start of 14. And examination of those 49 found that close to half of them didn't hunt. You know, they might have owned a shotgun. They might have gone It's not hunting, to say they never hunted. But they... They're not avid. They're not... Yeah. Not even close to... Not avid. even close to... Not even What's close. less than avid? <laughs> maybe, maybe their husband hunted. Right. I, maybe their un- uncle hunted. But right. anyway, it became apparent that we had allowed a lot of uh, members that probably shouldn't have been allowed to join. So, or, we, or maybe even really didn't really meet all the criteria. 
Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. A lot of the joints, like they did their due diligence in the beginning, but their their long term picture wasn't was a real the same. wasn't wasn't the same wasn't the same. And so what, you know, we we needed to flush, and so with that, there be, it, and it was kind of a difficult several months because people got very emotional about it, and you know the bottom line was we created a we. A board of directors and Bill Athens and I since we had started the Alliance over 20 years prior we sat down and we picked what we would felt would be the best board of directors for the organization out of the existing other Alliance breeders right yeah and we wanted we wanted a board of of people under 50 that oh. was kind of our goal. Well, well, you know, I, I know where you're, I know where you're going. Yeah, I agree with it. But you know, but, you, you kind of wiped a lot of the other guys. Like, look, we love you. Well, we you're too old. We didn't. We didn't really even. There's only Bill and I that were probably probably too old. No, um, but then then we took uh, six more members and made them as an advisor to each board member. So we we had a good. Uh, group of people to uh, kind of run the show and uh, the, the people we picked we picked Mark Olcott in Maryland he's a he's a veterinarian he has two versatile champion females we picked uh, Brandon Smith up in Washington uh, a NAVDA judge has one or two utility prize one dogs we picked Lee Branch down in uh, Mississippi Lee Branch has been extremely uh, instrumental years ago with uh, American Field and the, and the Hall of Fame there in Tennessee so he's got he, he offered a lot and we Dale Parker in Colorado uh, a dog trainer uh, a pheasant guide and runs a boarding business uh, Todd Bauer in in Montana uh, a, a full-time dog trainer Jason Mix in uh, Minnesota, and Jason is a, a military man, just a just a wonderful human being. Anyway, we picked these people, and you know what's what's so ironic? All of the squabbling just went away. This group, this group has so much fun in their Zoom meetings, and 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 they've they've really projected, you know, what I call an elite group. Of breeders, not just breeders, but they the, the word elite is is often they're, used. they're truly on <clears throat> truly on the same page. Yeah, and I mean you can you know you can look at somebody that breeds hunting dogs and you can you can tell where their true passion is. Are they trying to breed the absolute top quality, or are they just trying to breed dogs for a paycheck? And this group, you, it's it's very it's very apparent. That uh, their their entire purpose of being on this board is to promote the Poodle Pointer as a top hunting dog, and you know, unfortunately, out of those forty nine, I think twenty of them were eliminated. You know, for various reasons, a couple of them didn't hunt. A couple of them had never had never tested a dog in a NAVDA test. Uh, or they, actively they, breed with a program of their own, even they right? Just, yeah, and they, so they they liked it, but they just didn't. They didn't feel, see it through. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. The the board just didn't feel that they they were on the on the right journey. Right, and uh, a couple people were eliminated because they were troublemakers. Uh, continually, you can do that. You can get rid of troublemakers. I think <laughs> when you have your own club. I think, I think if you have. <laughs> if you, I, I got a night. Yeah, that's going to go on another podcast. I would love to get rid of some troublemakers. But anyway, that the revision came about. I would I would say anybody that listens to this podcast, if you want to know where the where the Napa is today, go to poodlepointer.org and spend thirty minutes on that website, and you will see. I don't know twenty five thirty of the top stud dogs in North America top female poodle pointers in North America. And you'll also see the vision and, 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 you know, how professional this organization is. That's all thanks to Brandon Smith. Brandon Smith 
kind of uh, reshuffled it and reshuffled stacked up the cards. Everything. And he really, he really, he can't, he created a website that is unbelievably informative. Right. Right down to the point of how do you read Breedmate software? Yeah. Proposed breedings. How do you read that? How do you, how do you make something out of that? And he's, he's given examples on there on, on our website and, for somebody that really is inclined to do research before they buy a dog, you really need to spend an hour on that website. There's so much information. Well, I was telling you, I've heard the name Breedmate for a long time. I, I heard the name, the word coefficiency. I'm like, oh, this must be important. You could have probably explain it to me for an hour, but when I saw it, and then the the actual dog is highlighted in a different color, and then you see where the numbers go to at the top, it's like I finally now understand it. it it's, I don't know why I didn't. Maybe it's because I'm high school educated, you know, highly high school educated. But I got a feel for it now that that'll stick in my head. That seeing a dog's name and then seeing it down here, seeing it down here, but not seeing it stacked on top of each other, how that creates that coefficient. When did, when did the Lions start using that more than not? When we first formed... The Alliance, let's say, 20-some years ago. Right. Uh, we purchased that software. We, oh, okay. We paid a kid. You know, we all pitched in. We paid a kid to enter. You have to enter all the dogs into your own database. So that's manual entry. Yep. Yeah. And once you have all the dogs uh, entered, then it's it's a just a quick calculation that the program the does The program for you. does. Okay. You know, in... Today, there's probably five or six alliance breeders that have their own their own breed mate software, so they don't have to reach out. I mean, Brandon Smith has it. Right. Rod Rist has it. Jason Mix has it. Uh, Jack Tracy has it. And they, they do their own, so they can sit there at their computer. Right. And they don't have to send an email out and say, hey, could you give me a breed mate on these, right. these two dogs? And the breed... The breed mate, basically, you enter a, a male and a female as a proposed breeding. Right. And it, it gives you a calculation of the coefficient of inbreeding and what you're looking for, you, what you're wanting to just have a quick view of how close is this breeding. Is this going to be... Uh, is this going to be an inbreeding, a line breeding, or an outbreeding? An outbreeding would be two very, very unrelated dogs. And you... You know, if you bred a Brittany to a Labrador, the inbreeding coefficient would be zero. If you bred a father to its daughter, I would guess the inbreeding coefficient would be over 30%. And that's so when you see an over 30%, you know, that spells caution. You're right. It's something you probably don't want to do. You know, and so you can quickly look at that, but. The other, the other part of the formula that really helps you increase uh, the potential of top top rated hunting dogs is to look at the coefficient of relationship of all the dogs. And traditionally, it's called the COR, coefficient of relationship. And traditionally, in an outbreeding, two unrelated dogs the two parents would contribute 50% each to the litter of puppies. The four grandparents would contribute 25% each. And the and next generation, 12.5. 12.5. Well, when you, when you raise the, the coefficient of inbreeding and you start getting into a line breeding, you start seeing some of the dogs that have been used more, you're going to see their COR increase. And if they're kind of the hero on the pedigree... That's what you like to see. If they're a dog that you really don't care for on the pedigree, you'd like to see a, a low COR, maybe something under 20%. And this is, this is uh, it's kind of like rolling the dice. You, you hope the puppies turn out like, like what the program says. And right. I can tell you, it usually, it usually is, is, comes true. Would, uh, Bob, would that be true to say, <clears throat> but if, if you, you, you do these breedings to the best of your ability, like a lot of people try to do, how, how much is nature and nurture? Could a person get one of those and still do well with the dog if they didn't really follow a program? You know what I mean? Could, 
it doesn't guarantee the outcome of the test score because you've got to also be a trainer, right? Sure. But for natural ability, does it kind of lend itself almost to being? Well, I th- <laughs> not a guarantee, but not I mean closer than utility because you've got to learn how to be a good dog trainer to do utility. Right. Right. So I think I think so. I think when you start looking at the past and you look at how well certain stud dogs have, you know, how prepotent they truly are, and then other stud dogs, they don't seem to produce as well. You don't really see. Uh, you don't that see, same performance, that yeah, same the, consistency in the litter, in 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 the pups when right, they get natural right. ability. When you see, when you see a stud dog, and the average score of fifty NA dogs is one ten, you uh, you 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 pretty well know you've lined things up right. properly. <clears throat> That's where I was <clears throat> going with the the NA dog. You could get that dog into a a newbie person. A person you're like, yep, he's in it, they're in it, they're, they've got a nice house, a nice yard, they're going to take good care of this pup, they're going to test it. They don't really have to be a trainer yet. No. They just got to get some exposure, meet a few people, Yeah, and you could somewhat count on that puppy to perform. We could always have a bad track or something weird, but I mean, oh, yeah. more consistently, you're just going to get those good puppy scores because of that coefficiency. You, you see it yeah. all the time. Yeah. And then with because they've got the inherited traits, the seven inherited traits, that does lend itself to the UT score later. But again, there's a lot of human influence in UT. There's a lot of obedience that has right. to come into right. into play. Yeah, and and as you as you go up the curve, a lot could, more. Obedience. We need. Can we get a breed mate for breed or for trainers? <laughs> Wouldn't that be great if the trainers, the trainer scores all showed up and like, well look, well, look when he was doing it twelve years ago. I think, boy, he was not doing too good. I, I, I wonder if you could, yeah, on some of our famous athletes, you go, right? Gee, what made Brett Farr such a great football player? Right. And Tiger Woods such a great golfer? And their dads. Their dads. Their dads. One hundred percent. Going to dads like it's parenting. Everybody, in your case, you know, you, you've been given a few acronyms and a few titles in in the poodle pointer world, but your dog Tucker, right? It. Everybody says they get a one. You know, one great dog in her life. I don't want to think so because if that's true, mine was mine was two dogs ago, and I don't know if I'm. Yeah. But how did where did Tucker come out of? Was it from a few generations of you breeding, and then how did he get to be Tucker? Tucker's daddy was out of the first litter of poodle pointers I ever had. A dog named Amadeus, who was a prize one UT dog when he was I don't know 15 months old. He was a phenomenal dog and Tucker was a puppy that as a pup well we were swimming yesterday and I I can't get in my swimming pool and not think of Tucker yeah Bob and I were skinny dipping yesterday but in (laughs) let's just be honest Bob but you know he at, at at seven weeks old he'd swim laps with me and I'd never seen a puppy like this I'd never seen a puppy that was so attached that he had to be wherever I went whatever you know, if we'd, I'd come in the house and close the door, he'd sit at the door and cry. He wanted, and he was so unique. And he just, and as a little puppy, he had quite a launch into the water. Well, I kept him just not knowing what I was going to have. And, uh, you know, I've gone back and after, since Breedmate, and I've checked his mother and his father, and what was the COI that created Tucker? Oh, because you could just... Pretend like tomorrow I wanted yeah. to breed those two dogs. Exactly. And it came, oh, that's really cool. And it came out 21%. And I went, oh. wow, 21%. And, you know, and I, I knew Clyde Vetter did a lot of breed mate calculations. Mm-hmm. I talked to Clyde quite a bit on the phone about, you know, what, what, what do you see? And, you know, he said, I want to see over 20%. In, for my top breedings, I, mm-hmm. you know, because I want to stack the deck with all the winners. Yeah. You know, and I, I read a lot of articles about breeding horse races, horses for horse racing. Sure. And, and I came up with, when, when you look at Tucker's pedigree, it was just purely, I had two wonderful dogs. I bred them and I made Tucker. Well, as he, as he went along through life, 
I've not in my life seen a more powerful retriever. I, the dog. And you were in a retrieving world back in the day, before I, you ever had poodle pointers. I field trialed Chesapeake's. I remember going to the Lab Nationals, and I took Tucker along just for company, and at, at a break, I threw a dummy out in this pond with about a six-foot bank that he launched off of, and he must have gone over 30 feet and splashed. And I remember listening to the gallery go, oh, my God. Who's, whose lab was that? And I then Ted Miller <laughs> says, that was Bob Ferris and his damn poodle pointer showing <laughs> off. But Tucker was just an explosive water dog and an explosive retriever. I watched him retrieve two live pheasants in North Dakota, bring them both back alive in his mouth and go on point with those two birds in his mouth. I, I've never heard of a dog doing that. He's just like some overachiever. Just some. I've seen him retrieve ducks on the opposite side of the Snake River, which is two, three hundred yards. Chase a crippled duck. There was no quit in him, and he just—he was something. Uh, he was so he was he was a dog that I could have never got a prize one UT on. He was, and I he could have never run in the in a in- invitational because he didn't share. I mean, he would never back another dog. Right. He, I ran him in one shoot retrieve field trial. He took f- first place by, I think he scored fourteen hundred points, which you know, eight hundred will win any shoot retrieve. Right. He, you know, we, I had a bet with the the guy running the English setter, who's going to find the first bird. And when we come over the hill, Tucker was on point. And the setter was backing him, and I, I know exactly what happened. The setter found the bird. <laughs> I know where you're going. And the setter, and Tucker stole it, and nobody got to but see it. But nobody saw that part. Nobody saw it. So now they see the setter behind Tucker? Yeah. Or, I mean, the, the yeah. Op, yeah, the, yeah. I mean, I've got like, pictures yeah. of Man of War on point, and Tucker crowding in right in front of him, and Man of War peeking over his back like, hey, that was my bird, you know, when we were chucker hunting. But <laughs> he was... I would tell people that would come here and say, you'll go to your grave and you'll never forget this dog. He was so unbelievably affectionate towards strangers. And he was just, but you know, more than that, ironically. Sounds like Seabiscuit. He kind of was. You know, all they had to find out with Seabiscuit was let another horse try to pass him and watch me pass you. And watch him go. (laughs) Well, you know, the, the great part about him was... You know, he he bred a lot of dogs in his day, different kennel. I think seven different Poodle Pointer kennels used him. And the average natural ability score, I think, was 111. That, that, doesn't, seem, average. that doesn't seem possible. I, that's, and I, I, I haven't seen it. I had somebody run the numbers. Yeah. And they said, I, I can't believe, you know, you could have bred him to a goat and you got good dogs. <laughs> you might have got <laughs> but. He With just, horns, yeah, yeah, I was just lucky. I was just lucky, you know. And that was happened to be the the dog you kept. Now, what about Tucker's litter mates? Do you? I did you? I don't. Were you able to stay in touch with them? I mean, you've I had don't. so much history of dogs. I know you couldn't pull that off the top you know, of that, your head. That's that's interesting. But I don't. I never really looked to see. I know there was a. I know there was a female that went to Utah, and a professional trainer was talking about this great. Dog. So it would have been Tucker's sister. Tucker's sister. Yeah. And it was a dog that I was originally going to keep out of that litter until he went swimming with me. And then I said, ah, I think I'll keep this male. I wasn't looking for a male. Right. Am- Amadeus was still a young dog. Uh, I didn't I didn't really need a, an, a stud dog. A stud dog. Yeah. But just the uniqueness of him. Uh, you just. Yeah. I mean, I could sit here and tell you stories all day long about Tucker, you know, right. being in casinos in Nevada and and jumping up on the craps table when he saw somebody throw the white dice. I mean, he <laughs> just exploded. Yeah. And so did all the chips on the table. <laughs> it just, but he just was, he, you know, kind of like what you said, I'll, I'll never own another Tucker. Right. I, and I don't want to. I don't. Yeah, want I to. guess I'm just hoping I haven't had my Tucker yet. You know? yeah. I but, just don't. But you, you know. had your Tucker kind of. You were still hitting it hard in the hunting and oh, the Chucker Hills. Oh, yeah, and yeah, yeah. I probably, you know, there was a time. You know, you can look in my 
family room and you realize real fast this guy shot a lot of stuff with hair on it and uh, and obviously a lot of birds and, and during those days I hunted over 80 days a year over 80 easily with a job with a full-time job with a full-time <laughs> yeah. job and a full-time kennel and and yeah, thank God you just, married LaFay yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah I've never had her even question me going hunting I mean whether I was going to the Northwest Territory sheep hunting and the whole back of the house was open for a remodel, and she didn't even have a back wall on the bedroom <laughs> when I went on one sheep hunt. And I've never had her question. It's like Does she have a sister about my age. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just just curious. No, no, no big deal. Well, um, I mean, if I say you know Tucker was such a gift. so, did you use him for some blood tracking, or did you just take him with you because he? I just took him. You just he took just, him with he you. He was just always, just, you know, he was just always around wherever I went, whatever. I, yeah. He was on almost every hunt I went on. You know, he was, he was my sidekick. Yeah. Uh, he lived in the house. He was never, never out in the kennel ever. Right. He was just our house dog, and and you know, I still, you know, he's got a, his old bed is laying next to my side of our bed, and. I still get up sometimes and go, oh, I got to make sure I don't step on Tucker. <laughs> and I just leave it there. Yeah. You know, and I let other dogs sleep on it too. Stop Maybe some will rub, something will rub off on them. They'll, yeah. get, they'll get a little Tucker dander in them. But, it, <laughs> you, know, our, you know, he's very celebrated. He's very celebrated. Oh, yeah. I, I, mean, he's... I, did a, I did a breeding this year. Ironically, Brandon Smith sent me a breed mate and said, you need to breed... Artemis or Tegan to your dog Diesel, and he said, so you, "You get on the computer then and start pulling this up." Well, so he sent me the breed mate. Okay. He said, he said "Examine this." He said, "If you want to, if you want to recreate Tucker, here's how you're going to do it." And I looked at it and I, I couldn't believe it. I mean, it's like, it's like I spent 30 years breeding poodle pointers to get to this one breeding, but I there was not pre-planned at all. It just kind of, it happened. But Tucker is in five generations on this pedigree and he's not doubled up anywhere he's in the second third fourth fifth and sixth generation his yet, CO- yet in that generation he's only there once he's only once and then he's maybe on the top side once and then the next generation yeah, he's yeah. on the exactly. <clears throat> right right and his cor his coefficient of relationship is 58 percent times five the father is only giving, Diesel's only giving 67% times one. Wow. <laughs> that letter, and that letter, you know, you get you, you get to leave something behind, you know, when you're a breeder, if you're, if, if you're successful. If, yeah. you, and what I've left behind is four breeders have those puppies. And I know Brandon Smith will take his and Todd Bauer will take his. They'll take it to the top. And uh, so, hopefully, hopefully, and and the, Tucker's uh, frozen semen's been used, you know, a number of times and produced some really nice dogs. But uh, it may not produce him. May, but may not produce but him. His but his skill set, his desire, yeah, his drive, yeah, and all yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah, and hopefully it'll because he'd have to be raised by Bob Ferris to become Tucker. Yeah. You maybe. know, our dogs kind of read us, and you're goofy. I so hope, he, you know, <laughs> I hope. Well, I mean, we are goofy. I mean, right. Christ, we're out there in the pool last night. Yeah. After a couple of beers, you know, and we're doing synchronized swimming. swimming. Yeah. You know. And LaFay said, "You boys put some clothes on." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, you know, I remember reading uh, Whaley's book, Snakefoot. Right. And you and I were talking this morning in your office, and. That was the first time I understood the word, you know, prepotent, like a male right. could throw himself. Again, not his identical personality, but his skill set. And that's kind of what Tucker was able to do with those kind of scores. Has to be. Yeah, you know, Bob Whaley was really instrumental in myself because, you know, I talked to him on the phone when I first started out. I don't know if I've told you this no, story. No, I didn't know you had a connection there. I, I left him a phone message, and about two weeks later, I got a phone call, and the other end said, this is Robert G. Whaley. What would be the purpose of our conversation, Mr. Ferris? <laughs> I'm like, wow, 
wow, that sounds like a professor that I've been skipping college for <laughs> right. or something. You know? and so I told him I had poodle pointers and I did a lot of water fouling and I wanted to create my own line that was strong in winter water fouling. And I said, you know, I've read, you know, and he, he so his first question was, well, you know, how many dogs do you have? And I said, well, yeah. I, I have two females, they're, they're litter mates, and then I have a male that's not related. And he paused a minute and he said, well, mister, you're nothing but a effing backyard breeder. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, the king just struck me down. <laughs> and he said, you call me when you have five males and 15 females, you call me, we'll have a conversation. Really? And I never forgot that, you know. I just, you know, today I probably have six or seven males I can use. I've got 20, 30 females if I want to use them. I, right, because so a lot I, of times you, when you sell a dog, part I, of that is you're still in my, you're in my yeah. stable. You're in my stable. Just like yeah, I, I don't even sell them. I give them away. Yeah. I give them away, and I keep the registration, and I just say, here's you a free dog. I'll be back to test it and train it, and, right. and maybe I'll breed it. But that's kind of how I've been able to do what Bob Whaley did with his English pointers. I mean, he had a huge facility. Right. And uh, But that that really struck home that you, you have to have an inventory to be a successful breeder. You can't. And here, here's here's the one, one thing. One litter a year, just doing something no. here. You're, you're you're just hoping for good stuff. Well, you're just making puppies yeah. for other people, right? To, to and they could be good enjoy. puppies, but oh, yeah. they're, they're not. Oh, yeah. You're not yeah. creating a line like right. his his line of pointer pointers. See, is, he, he he started something back back when Bob Whaley was first getting into field trials with his pointers. People called a female dog a brood bitch. And they didn't care if she was capable of anything because the capabilities all came from the male, from the sire. That was the mindset. At the, yeah. Yeah. Bob Whaley said, I think I'm going to start only breeding field champion females. I'm going to make my females be field champions too. And because he knew that genetically there was just as much and maybe even more coming right. from well, the he female. Did, he did cattle genetics. He raised he, cattle. He, he raised... Foxes too, I think, or something. He he was he was he loved genetics. Right, right. So I have kind of, you know, I'm kinda, I'm a Bob Whaley fan all the way. So yeah. if I read Snakefoot and I read what he what he promoted, I look now like last year, I bought a dog, I bought a dog from Mark Olcott in Maryland. The mother is a versatile champion. I got a dog from uh, Ryan Bird in Maryland. The mother is a UT Prize One dog going to the Invitational next month. Uh, I got a dog from Stephen Lundy in Texas. The mother is a Prize One UT dog. So I've I've come up. I got another dog from Minnesota from Tim Plug. The mother is a Prize One UT dog. Now, when you back when I first got into poodle pointers, there was one female UT Prize One dog in the history of the breed. <laughs> that, that was it. it. And now, last year, I bought four or five puppies out of Prize One UT females, and I can tell you, every one of them has turned out. Every one of them. So you has, need that performance on both sides. I want. Not, uh, yeah. You can't just rely on. Well, and know. what's what's so what's so wonderful about where the alliance is today? We're now seeing so many females that are being used by the younger alliance breeders right. that are prize one UT or versatile and when, champions. And when you set it up in the beginning, you set a certain bar that one of them had to be the male or the yeah. female or then, but you guys kept raising the bar to, yeah. to what you're going to use Today, when, you, when you saw the, the numbers going up and say, Hey, next year our females have to be better exactly, or, or tell exactly. everybody, tell everybody in two years, yeah, you need to be breeding females that are. So yeah. you held yourself, you held your feet to the fire. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, today Which, I don't know. Is there another? No, bre- no, no. Today. I mean, because there's breed clubs. That's totally different. This is a breeders. This is only for breeders. And right. you, you know, to be a member of Napa, you have to have successfully 
run a poodle pointer in a NAVDA utility test right. successfully. Well, this eliminates an awful lot of people, and it, right. it, which is good because it... It, it gives the focus on the people that are really wanting to breed the absolute best possible, not just breed to make puppies for hunters right. or companions. Or, and, and so today, you, A, you have to be, to be a member, you have to have run a dog successfully in, in a utility test. The males have to have scored a minimum of 175 in a utility test. The females have to have scored a minimum of 105 in a NA test. So this this gives you know some pretty substantial uh, grounds you know for success. Yeah. And you know one of the things I I I promote Napa. I promote the organization for people looking for a, a very high end hunting dog. But you know not everybody's looking for a high end hunting dog. And so I, I, you know, I'm not going to beat up on other breeders because they don't belong to Napa. Right. I'm just saying that they might be making some really nice dogs, but sure. just know that you're not getting the whole package of the background, the history. Don't expect to get that. You, but you might get a nice dog if you're looking for. And you probably can get a nice dog. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you know, we've got some tremendous people out there that, you know, Daryl Pernat up in up in uh, Washington. Uh, his first hunting dog was a short hair from Clyde Vetter. He took it all the way to VC. He now has a poodle pointer that's, uh, I think it goes back to Pam Patton's dogs. And that dog is a 204 utility dog headed for the Invitational. And he's come over and trained with me, and I, that dog will, will definitely VC. It's, it's absolutely the real deal. And he's now, once he, he's already made an AKC Master Hunter out of that dog, he'll make a Shoot to Retrieve Champion out of that dog. All, all those things. They're all a little all. different. They're all different things. You know. Hold on one second, Bob. All right, so, yeah, we had, a, we had a little mic change, a little mic change, no problem. But go back to talk about that dog with... Uh... Daryl, well, Daryl Pernat, the, this is a sensational dog, and... Uh, it's interesting. I mean, he's, he's a 204 utility dog. Uh, he owns a Master Hunter already, AKC Master Hunter. Uh, you know, incidentally, you can't register. You can register poodle pointers in AKC, but not, but not as a as a breeder. But you can register them to where you can uh, do some of their events, where they're obedience. Hunt tests. Hunt tests. But you you can't compete for a championship title, which would be a show ring or a a field champion. Really? Yeah. But you can can compete for, not even compete, you can test in their hunt tests. To get their junior, senior, master. That's right. But you know Daryl's dog's name is Noonan, and Noonan has had has a litter of puppies with uh, with Brandon Smith's Prize One UT female, and I guess what I'm hearing is these puppies are off the charts good, and uh, just stellar, stellar puppies. And you know I think this goes back to what Bob Whaley was after. If you have a top end female. You know, Bob Whaley would outbreed. I can't remember the the pointer's name that he would outbreed to, but Noonan is a total outbreed to Brandon's dog, and this is usually a home run. And you, when you do that, you cut the COI right in half, uh, and you you drop it way down, and then you can come back and breed into your line. And you know, it's it's just kind of a fun puzzle to play with, uh, but. You know, and there's a, there's a variety. You know, one of the things I'd want to say is there's a variety of people that do not belong to Napa for a variety of reasons. Probably the the largest breeder in North America is uh, Rock Creek Kennels in. I hear the name all the time. Minnesota. <clears throat> right. Yeah, and uh, Scott, I've talked to Scott several times. I said, you know, why don't you join the our alliance and. You know, he came up with an extremely, a pretty valued excuse, and it was, he said, you know, I 
I live with my dogs, I hunt my dogs, and I know my dogs. And he said, when you look at a NAVDA exam, and it's, you know, somebody's going to evaluate my dog for, say, 30 minutes on one day, three judges, and they're going to come up with a score, and I have to live with that score. He said, I don't, I don't want to put myself in that position. I want to be able to evaluate on my own. You know, and I give him tremendous kudos because, you know, I just looked and saw where he had, I think, five utility prize dogs from his kennel. His wife ran two of them. So, you know, he's, he's doing extremely well. Mark Olcott's versatile champions both came from, uh, from Scott at Rock Creek. So it isn't like the alliance is the is, only th no 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 no, <clears throat> no. and you, you you're gonna find people that uh, you know we have a lady over in Oregon uh, Tiffany Fellows that's was uh, basically at Bodo's bedside when he died and Tiffany is wants to you know stand by oh is uh, she working with his lines based still yeah I didn't fact, even know that in fact she has a dog named Bodo really uh, yeah and I don't know, you know, she promotes exactly the same thing as the Alliance, but she just hasn't joined. Right. And, uh, but, but, you know, to that point, like, I, when we started off talking about it, how I was trying to do something, or I wanted to start the conversation of doing something common with these Broncos when they got in here, and I got into the Bracco Italianos. And I, you know, it kind of fell on deaf ears. But then a couple people reached back to me and said, you know what? I would want to do it. So to your point, if people hear this, I don't care what breed you're running, at least make your own, set your own bar high. And set your own... Exactly. Right. Don't be afraid to go like, oh, I can't... Don't be afraid to say, I can't breed that dog. Right. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah. I think that, like, that's the bottom line message. There's dogs out there that are bred. You're not going to get some crazy psychopathic murdering Charlie Manson dog. But if the breeders would at least try to set their own bar sure, and not close their eyes on the ones that they kind of know in their heart of hearts, they probably shouldn't have bred. I remember I met Bodo up in Ontario, and I had a little wire hair named Desi. And I, I felt, she, I was smitten by, you ever get smitten by one of your dogs? Like, they could almost, like, like okay, you're, you're being a real jerk. But, man, I don't know why I love you so much. And I, yeah. I kind of let her get away with a lot, you know. But I just, she was a people dog. She was a little dog. And so the uh, Jack Haig and that chapter up in Ontario had Bodo and Ed Bailey get together for the first time in decades. Yeah. And I was the only guy that crossed into Canada, there was no restrictions at all. This is 15 years ago or better, maybe 18 years ago. And they had Ed and Bodo together, and it was about 20, 30-some chapter members of that chapter. And I was the only guy from an outside chapter that went up there. I'm like, i got to go see these two icons, right? And um, I was telling them about, and they, they gave us each a little table time, you know, to see your dog, put their hands on your dog. And I told Bodo... I said, uh, uh, I said, you know, she's got the first time I started doing a drag with her. She started digging a hole while she had the duck in her mouth, <laughs> and he goes, "You just not breed this dog. This dog's <laughs> not breedable." And I was like, "Oh no! <laughs> oh no! Am I gonna be able to go home and tell myself, well, she was just digging a hole?" But that's what I'm saying. People, if they could get the rose-colored glasses off. Yeah. And say, okay, I'm not going to have a litter this year, but maybe this one will meet the criteria. Right. Um, right. As opposed to worrying about their waiting list. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. I yeah. mean, you showed me, I'll try not to be over informational, but I sh you showed me the Cedar Woods waiting list. It's very complicated. To, I mean, there's a lot of data in that waiting list. And you're like, you're not hurrying it up because you got more people on a waiting list. No. It, it's going to be... What's ever going to be available is only what's going to be available. Yeah, and I'm not. I'm not one to like. You know, I'm. I if if somebody sincerely wants a poodle pointer instead of say a Brittany, and they know I'm, I'm I'm all about helping them find one. Right. 
And, you know, when people say, well, I've seen, you know, this Kennel Rock Creek, mm -hmm. I'll say, you know, he raises good dogs. A lot of the dogs pass and they, qualify. And they, you know, they, you, you got, you, what you need to do is learn the, the, who the mother and father are, though. And you do need to learn research. about them. Do yeah. the research. Yeah, and no different than learn about my dogs. Right. If you're going to buy a dog from me. Don't, yeah, don't just buy Bob's dog. Learn, learn about him. Learn, learn about him. Learn, yeah. learn. What's the mother like? Is she a house dog? Yeah. Mm -hmm. is, is the male a house dog? In my case, yeah, they're all house dogs. And, you know, I really promote that. When you, you know, Tiffany, even though she's not a member of our organization, I had a, I had a huge utility training day down at the swamp this spring. She came. I got to meet her. And, you know, what a wonderful lady. She brought me flowers and said, these are for your wife. Really? Yeah, and I thought, you know, that's that's something that uh, <laughs> I'm not really used to. But <laughs> you know, I I she'll she'll be forever good to the poodle pointer. Right. Uh, you know, she has very high expectations of her customers, and but for she just doesn't want to, you know, have a, a group of people probably telling her what to do. Right. You know, the first dog that first litter I had Amadeus out of. And Bodo judged Amadeus, and he he earned a utility prize one. And I'll never forget Bodo saying, I would love to breed to this dog. He says, best poodle pointer alive today. He says, but I can never breed to him. And I thought, well, well that makes no sense. Huh. But in Europe, they like to keep their kennel names within themselves. And when you look at the... At, at, at what Bodo has mostly done, it's winter health, winter health, winter health, winter health. And he doesn't go out and, and go to other kennels for, right. you know, because he's going to put their kennel name on right. his. And a, and, so there's like almost no outcross. I, I don't know. There's never been a cedarwood dog on any of Bodo's pedigrees. Right. But that's just the Europe, kind of the European way. It's the way he did it. It's what are you going to do? It. It's the way he did it, you know. And I'm I, sure if he was here today, he would defend it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I don't know. I don't. I don't. I don't want to have tunnel vision to where I can't see beyond my own kennel, and I can't Other see kennels. beyond this organization right. that right. Bill Bill Athens and I created. Yeah. And you know, I don't ever want to do that. I no, and I, you know, t I was going to ask you last night when uh, we were just sitting around about Rock Creek, you know, and here today, I did, that was like totally unexpected, like, here's this guy that's doing a great job, not part of the Alliance, but he's doing a good job of working with that breed of dog. Yeah. It's, yeah. And yeah, that, yeah. that's good for people to hear. So last night we, t we said this, and I tell you, I get, I, you have a, you have a uh, cut and paste response when people write you, "Hey Bob, I'm looking for a dog, or I'm thinking of this." You, because otherwise you'd be typing, twelve hours a day. So, right. and I have a pet response to people who, who write me the email, and I get it a lot. It's I'm thinking of a, a Munsterlander, a Griffin, and a German Shorter. Just pick three breeds, and I tell them, you might be better off if you just found. A breeder in driving distance to you that might breed something that is not one of those three, but build a relationship with him, get to know his dogs, and that dog could become your favorite breed if you have that that backup of making a relationship with the breeder. Unquestionably. Yeah. Unquestionably. It, when I it could have been anything for you, right? When I, when I moved here, graduated with Boise State, I found out duck hunting is a, is a, uh, there, there's a lot of waterfowl here. Yeah. So, it's like being in Iowa and not being a wrestling I mean, fan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. I needed a, I needed a, I needed a retriever. And, and you had Chessies. Well, I bought a Chessie, yeah. and I got it from Dr. John Lundy, and you know, Doc John is in the Retriever Hall of Fame. That's how big he was, and he had a dog named Adam Bob. Um, three of my dogs were out of Adam Bob over the years, and. I did exactly what you're talking about. I, I hooked up with John. I started training with him. I, I it's met, like you kind of fell in love with him, so to speak, well, or his he methods. Was, he, he was the master, you know, and, right. and you know, I, I can go on and on right. about the Chesapeake's, but, you know, from that, 
Linda Harger moved here, and there's unquestionably she's the number one Chesapeake field trialer there's ever been. I don't know. I need to many. interview her then. Oh, she's 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 she's, a, she's an unbelievable. I get a lot of trainer. requests. How come you've never done an episode on Chessies, and I don't know the person? Oh, you should do. Yeah, Linda is, but these with without these people in my background, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have succeeded. Right. You know, I I used to hunt and with a guy named Jim Reed that owned a short hair, Lancer D. Lancer D was a national champion. And uh, from that, I met Dave McGinnis. And by the way, you know, both Lancer D and Dave McGinnis are in the Bird Dog Hall of Fame. And so I rubbed shoulders with some right. powerful people. And it starts from saying hello and being interested in their breed and interested and, in their successes. Yeah. You, you learn, you, you know, if what you're saying, get to know and kind of piggyback on this individual. And if they're that, good, they're going to let you piggyback on. Sure. Yeah. I mean, Dave Walker, the famous the famous Brittany pro, pro he lived right. right down the street here, four houses down. You know, when, he, when I met him, he was my neighbor. Uh, Richard Robertson was right down on Overland Road, runs Tacoma Mountain Sunrise and American Field. So, right. I've been really fortunate that I've been able to suck a lot of information, especially in training, right. out of some tremendous people. Right. You know, I trained every day, uh, not every day, but I right. trained in the summer with a guy named Larry Bergman, who had a national champion Labrador that lived here in Boise. You know, when we talk about those names, the name Clyde Vetter would come up with that thought. I know a lot of people, especially some close friends of mine from Michigan, that have bought dogs from Clyde, and I've heard this story from other people, that you're welcome back there. He's going to put you to work. Yeah. You're, you're spending a day as a bird boy, bird helper, you know, whatever it is. But it's like he takes you in as part of the family. Like, yeah, you want to come come up for a week? Come up and train your dog? And, yeah. and they get to know him. And then that just increases your success even. Sure, you know, that, sure. Like, they could call him up at night and go like, this isn't him. He said, try this. But they've already met each other. They trust each other. And then you you end up sticking with that. Yeah. So that to that point, yeah, the kind of like falling in love with your breeder can be half the battle. <clears throat> if he's, you know, obviously. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You learn, you, you, learn, you learn certain tricks. I, you know, I use a bird launcher where I'll set it across the pond. I'll take a white bag that groceries come in and I'll put a rock in it and tie it shut I'll put it in the bird launcher and then I can push the button and I can launch that white bag up in the air about five ten feet and it comes down and splashes but guess what it sinks and goes out of sight and right behind the launcher is a dead duck right and so so you can do this thing solo I can do this solo Daryl Pernat comes over to train with me from Seattle, and that's the first thing I catch him doing. And I said, "Where the hell did you learn that, <laughs> Clyde Vetter?" <laughs> and I'm like, "I'm like son of a bitch. I learned I learned it from Clyde Vetter over the phone, right? You know, so cats out of the bag. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it's a great duck a, search scores are going up. <laughs> it's a great training tool, especially yeah. for the long retrieve at right. the Invitational. So pe- people got to be, you got to want to suck up. You got to yeah. want to be a sponge." If you're not, and you're you're yeah. only gonna you're everything. only gonna clean the countertop once or twice. Yeah, you know? yeah. you're I a mean, paper towel. Yeah, everything. A sponge I've learned, can absorb a whole lot more information. Everything I've learned has come from other people right. in training. Most of it. Yeah, most you know. But I've just been fortunate that there's been some powerful dog people that have lived right here in this Boise area. Yeah, it sounds I've like been it. Very, very fortunate of that and. Let, let's go out of area. We had a note that I wanted to ask you about the Bird Dog Hall of Fame Museum. Yeah, I went. I went a couple of years ago. Uh, the guy that ran the Bird Dog, Dog Hall of Fame called me, and he asked me. He said, "I wrote an art, read an article that you wrote about getting the uh, Grouse Grand Slam in Idaho in the month of September," and. He said, we have every upland bird in here except for a blue grouse and a spruce grouse. And he said, is there any way you could get those for me? And I said, yeah, I could. He's pretty easy. So I He's shot... He's a for taxidermy for yeah, their animal, yeah. their hall, yeah. 
So yeah. I went and collected one of each, and I sent them to my taxidermist, and I said, when you're done, send them to uh, Grand Junction, Tennessee, and uh, Gary Lockie will accept them. And so I did, and then he got back to me, and he said, hey, you really need to come and visit here, he said. And I said, you know, I'd, I'd love to do that. And we got to talking about all the people that I know that are in the Hall of Fame, Labrador people, Pointer people. Yeah. And he said, you know more people in this Hall of Fame, I think, than anybody I've ever talked to. He said, how in the hell's that? You live in Idaho? <laughs> and I said, you know, we just have a lot of top-end dog people here. And so anyway, I scheduled a trip mm -hmm. to go and visit. And LaFay and I went, and it, it was remarkable. And I, I saw my grouse sitting there in the foyer when you first walk in. And, yeah. and uh, I had no idea how prestigious that was and all the it's it's four buildings you you've been right, yeah i've been there a couple of times i mean yeah. it's for a, for a, i suggested years ago uh that we had a, we should have a they have a conference room there right that i wanted to have a judge's workshop there oh makes all the would sense. that be the best place to have a judge's workshop yeah because you can go to nashville and watch uh whatever star who, you want whoever's playing and or then you can an hour away you're at Sit in the little Junction. town of Grand Junction if you yeah. want to. Yeah. But that place is so steeped in history, and it's not just Pointer Setter. It certainly right. started from, you know, Wilson Dunn and exactly. all those guys. But there's the Labs have a section. The Britneys have a section. Yeah. So is the Poodle Pointer getting well, a so, section? So when we came, after I went and visited, and, you know, I talked with Tan Tanya that kind of runs this, her and, right. her and Gary, and... Uh, you know, I, ironically, when I left, Gary, he, you know, when, when I went, he said, you better come within the next few years. He said, I'm 95 years old, you know. So <laughs> I went, and he, what a wonderful man. Anyway, when I when I left, he said, well, is there anything you need to know? And I said, yeah, I need to know about that hat you're wearing. Hmm. And he had his Navy hat on, uh -huh. you know, and had the, the eggs the across the front, you yeah. know, and stuff. And he said, well, I retired from the Navy as a captain and he was you could tell he was very very proud of his military career and right and I said well what'd you do and he said well he said I ran a ship but he said I followed the air the carriers around and any of the guys flying Corsairs that missed the carrier I picked them up out of the ocean hmm. and I said really I said well unfortunately you didn't get to meet my dad I said my dad flew Corsairs <laughs> over in uh, somewhere in the China Sea and I said, but he never, I said, I don't think he ever missed the carrier. And, you know, we laughed and yeah. whatnot. Yeah. Gary looked up a bunch of stuff on my dad and sent it to me. And, but anyway, from that conversation, he got, he and Tanya looked at the, at the, uh, the Napa. Yeah. And they, <clears throat> they said, you know, you guys should be in the Hall of Fame. You should be here. You should have a, you know, a spot and booth, if you will, yeah. a corner, a wall, of, you know. You know, and very ironically, Lee Branch, who's on our, our one of the board members for, for Napa, uh, was very influential in the beginning of of the of the Bird Dog Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. And he ran English pointers and right. he knew all the players, he knew Tanya real well, he knew Gary and so Lee we kinda of took the reins and, and they said, Yeah, yeah and you know, I, I sold a puppy this year via Bob West, who previously was president of NAVDA. Uh, yeah. And in our conversation, I said something to him. You know, they've kind of talked about this, all of the the alliance. So I, I said, look them up, look us up, look us, you know, read read about what this alliance is about. And he got back to me and he said, he said, you know, I'm on the board of directors for, uh, for the Bird Dog Museum, which... Yeah host the two Hall of Fames and he said you guys you you guys should be here your organization not the poodle pointer right not Bob Ferris not any the organization dog, the organization right tell that story yeah. yeah so I'm pretty sure we're gonna have Napa will be there within a year cool uh, they they found a spot for us and I've got a gal that's gonna build a booth maybe uh, just yeah, Something a display just, of sorts. Just a display, yeah. you know. Yeah. I was really impressed. I walked by the, the Gordon Setter uh, display just for the breed, mm -hmm. and it wasn't an individual. And I, but the picture really caught me. 
and it was a beautiful picture of a Gordon setter on point. And you know when you when you walk through the Hall of Fame, you see so many dogs just framed up like an oil painting of right. a pointer, a pointer, a pointer, a lab, a lab, a lab, yeah. and it just kind of runs together. Right. This Gordon setter just just kind of stopped me. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I had to look at it and I had to read about it. And right. I, and so we're gonna we're gonna attempt to do that for, for exclusively for Napa, and not really celebrate any individual dog or any any individual. Right. You know. Well, that's gonna be cool. I'm I'm planning. Greg Blair kind of promised me my buddy from Purina, who's kind of my go-to. Yeah. Under Carl. Yeah. Um. I did an interview with him, him in his house a couple months ago up in Wisconsin, and uh, I told him that I had been to the Ames Plantation on the last day of the running, but I didn't have a horse. I just happened yeah. to be coming home yeah. from a job. I got to see this place, and the place was empty because everybody's at the Ames Plantation, so I got yeah. myself over there in the morning, and I'm watching this gallery of horses take off, and I'm like, oh, what's going on here? Yeah. But that was the last brace. I stuck around, heard a bunch of old timers talking stories, yeah, yeah, and then I got to watch them do the saddle presentation of the winner. I think it was Miller's Silver Bullet or Silver Ending. I can't. It was a yeah. Miller something. Yeah, this is a long time ago. Yeah, and I said I've got to do this. I'm a, I'm not a great horseman. It's not even my venue. But to see that history, that steeped history of oh. that that's why all the effort that they put into the point. Let's just say the pointers and setters and stuff. They were way more dedicated than the average guy with a lab or a German short hair in the forties. Oh, these people have given, given their sweat and blood to still that are. breed, and uh, so I want to go down there and do a series of podcasts with some of the old timers yeah. down there next year. And I don't know how long my buck can stay in a saddle. I don't know if they'll yeah. let me do like a you know like. Can I just do for the first hour and then go back and put some monkey butt on my butt because I'm really sore? <laughs> and then I was told by a fellow we met yesterday, I think it was Derek Olson, he came out to, yeah, un, yeah. he wanted to meet some NABDA stuff. He's a field trailer. He horseback field And trailer. he suggested pantyhose, I think, or something to take the friction down. <laughs> I think yeah. it was him that suggested that. You get on one of those Tennessee walkers. I mean, I, I used to team rope. And you come out of a roping box from a still to whatever... 40 miles an hour. I mean, it just jars you yeah. to death. And I ended up is having that why your back, back is all? I ended up having back surgery, too much rope. And, but you get on a Tennessee walker, you're in a rocking chair. Right. Uh, it's it's so You don't even realize you're on a horse. And I used to go out and ride at some of the trials. Trials, you yeah. know. And, and, you know, some of my good, like Bridget Lettington, she's now running English pointers. And I knew her dad when her dad was running them before she was even born. Wow. And it's, but, I mean, it's, <laughs> yeah. it isn't, NAVDA, it's not all about NAVDA. No. It's about good dogs and good, you know. I have a thing on my pot, and I, and I do know I made this up. This is, nobody can steal this. I didn't get it copyrighted. But I, in, in the bottom of my website, I said, for me, it's about dogs and people we know, dogs and people that have passed on, and dogs and people we've yet to meet. Yeah, yeah. That's what yeah. like keeps this whole yeah this whole thing. Well, going. It's, I mean, it's interesting. Look at look at Bob West. Look at the history of Bob West. You know, his number was number two in NAVDA. Okay, mine is number one seventy four. Right. I don't know the new. He guy, might have got a bump. He but got he got a, <laughs> he got a bump. He got a bump when yeah. they created the numbers. The, the number system, yeah. right? Yeah, he's not. But your old. number's damn old. <laughs> My number's old. My number's. Well, old. you're old. One seventy four. Yeah. No, no, Bob, you're not one hundred and seventy four. <laughs> you're seventy four. I am. <laughs> you are seventy four. Yeah. But but when you look at his career, you know he's done NAVDA it's, for a long time. Worked for Purina, and he was president of NAVDA. Now he's running retrievers. Right. And he can't you know, stay out of it. He cannot stay out of the dog game. Right. And, you know, he's going to be successful with anything he does in the, right. in the dog game. And, right. and sometimes, sometimes I think people would do themselves a favor if they would go watch a retriever field trial. I'm doing it this next spring. And then, the SRS. And then go look at, at what goes on at a NAVDA natural ability water test. Yeah. I'm embarrassed by it. I'll just I'll just flat say I'm embarrassed because 
some guy can walk up and throw oh. ten dummies in the water and beg and plead and, right. and finally, you know, I'm I'm embarrassed. I right. think you know they need to get rid of that and they need to go to a bird and a forty yard retrieve with a shot and start testing. That's these not dogs. out of the limits of a young dog. God, By any means. God, no. I mean, God, how many no. people have taken their dog hunting at 10 months of age? Well, I know a bunch of people well, have. Or younger. Or younger. Younger. Right. You know, yeah. yeah, we could, you know what, when you invite me out to judge again, let's break down the test and the how we'd like it to be. Oh, they'll well, never, it, it'll well, never get changed. This is self-produced, and we can at least talk about some of the things we would, there's, like I said, we're not saying there's anything, we, we died in a wool. Nab to, you're a retired nab to judge. I'm in it knee deep. But when you love something so much, that's what sometimes spurs the change or the, the question, why don't we? And well, I, I like those. I, I'm, I like to be confrontational, and I like to be like, let's just have a big old discussion about it. Maybe not change, but... I'm going to get in trouble right now, but I don't have anything to lose. <laughs> but I'm going to get in trouble because if... If I if if I were God or if I were King, right, Navda would have a paid CEO that ran the organization. They would not have volunteers at the top end of the organization because it's would, a big enough organization to to Nav, do that. Navda could take over the dog world of sporting dogs if if they would make some some top end changes. One, they need to change the natural ability. They need to get rid of the pheasant track. Because it's so inconsistent, they need to. It's hard. It's hard to make it consistent. It, you can't make it consistent. Right, right. You know, you just can't. You try your best. So why not? Why not have a hundred yard drag of a dead bird and see if a dog will pick up a dead bird and not dig a hole while it's picking it up? Right. Yeah. Right. And why not have the water for the natural ability dog be a retrieve of a bird with a shot? It doesn't have to be say steady, but if no, they no, would, no steady. It's just. Exuberance to go do what he's going to, going to do eventually is you know they would yeah. they would they would raise the bar so much by doing those two things and there isn't anybody that's a breeder that wouldn't agree with me but it's just you know the, this mindset that well the data wouldn't compare to the data of 1969 well that that doesn't make any sense to me are Why? you t are you kidding me you think that you think that uh, medicine hasn't gotten better over the years? Clinical trials haven't produced. Foot, football players haven't gotten better. I yeah, mean, yeah, yeah. So, well, our next podcast in uh, eleven months, three weeks, and four days from now, when you have me come back out, <laughs> maybe the September test. It might be cooler. Yeah, we had, we had a great, we had a great, really had a great test out at your swamp. Uh, that's where Bob's duck camp is, and it's. It was very suitable to do a utility and NA test. And I want to say I've never been more beaten by the sun and sweated less in my life. I mean, I never sweated, but it was hotter than hotter than 80s. Dry heat. Oh, dry heat. I always hear that. Like, well, it's a dry heat. And they're like, well, so is an oven. Like, well, I was in an oven for the last, <laughs> the last two days. We got here, and I jumped in your pool, and I was going to walk into your pool. And you go, no, no, Ron, just jump in. Don't put your toe in it, because Bob doesn't heat the pool. <laughs> and the groundwater can stay pretty cool. And I jumped in there with a... <gasps> but I got up, then Bob jumped in, and we started shooting the shit. And I was like, I could have done another couple days. It kind of hit the, hit the reset button. <laughs> but thanks for having, thank you for your wife, LaFay, for yeah, allowing yeah. you to have this place. Because yeah. I know that's part of it. Oh, no, she's everything. And uh, thanks for inviting me and having me overnight. And I got to pack because you got to get me to the airport in about 30 minutes. All right. Yep, yep. No, it's been fun. It's been interesting. Always it's been fun. We have a bunch of conversations throughout the year that get fun. And some will get funner sooner than later. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs>